Okay, so we're up to part five in our series on John. We've just had the two readings that talked about uh, Jesus and his conversation with the Samaritan woman at the well. And uh, uh, one thing I would encourage you to do as soon as you get home after this message is Google the Chosen, the video, and, and Google the woman at the well. And it will, it, it's a dramatisation of this conversation Jesus had with the woman of the well. It's a must-see. It is really an exceptional... Uh, I don't usually like videos about uh, Jesus. They just look fake and, and, and artificial. This one, I just think, is really good and captures the essence of the conversation. So I encourage you to, to Google that when you get home. So who's ever been thirsty? really thirsty you know that kind of thirst where you go for i just don't have even even a sip i'm gonna die it's you know you're so parched you're so dry you're so hot you know that you need water um there's a a a story in one of the commentaries i read this week about uh, a, a man who was living in the middle east and he was sitting at a well just like the well in this story we read just before. And as he's there, he's watching this woman come and she has her bucket and she has her rope and she lowers the bucket down into the water and draws out this life-giving thing called water. Clean, clear When she's filled her bucket, she walks up the hill and disappears. Along comes an Arab man and he comes to the well and he's obviously desperately thirsty and he looks longingly down this deep well and he has nothing to draw the water from. And so we see, and there's this water down there, he's really thirsty, but he can't have it. But what he sees are these little droplets, these spills that this woman who just filled up her bucket with and walked off. And this man watches this Arab lean down and get every little drop, every little morsel that was spilt on the stones, just the littlest of, of droplet. He just reaches down. And parches his thirst, quenches his thirst. Water is essential to life, isn't it? Without it, we die. Without it, we uh, we can't live. And um, we get it on tap straight away. We turn the water on, and what do we get? Regular water uninterrupted water we are so spoiled in this country there are many countries in the world today who don't have that kind of water they have to travel to uh, uh, outside their villages to, to to find water and sometimes that water is not healthy sometimes that water is disease ridden but it's all they have to live on And that's why mission agencies go in there and and organisations around the world are sinking wells so that people can have more healthy, accessible water. It's just incredible, isn't it? We get this water on tap and it's clean and it tastes good. A little bit of chlorine in it, but that's okay. That's good for us. Not a bit of chlorine, a bit of fluoride doesn't help, doesn't hurt, does it? The Bible talks about water. Physical water, you know, mentions the the River Jordan a lot of times. It mentions uh, the Red Sea. It, it, It talks about rivers. It talks about streams, physical streams. But the Bible also talks about water in a spiritual way. And uh, it'd be great one day to do a sermon on the theology of water. 
Let me just give you some examples from the scripture about how the, 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 the Bible talks about spiritual water. Uh, Revelation, there's two readings here that are quite interesting, aren't there? Uh, Revelation 7 says, For the Lamb at the center of the throne will be their shepherd. He will lead them to springs of living water, and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. What's being said here is that uh, uh, Jesus is going to be at the center of the throne. He's going to be our shepherd. He will lead his people, those in the eternal kingdom, to streams of living water, springs of living water that will never run out. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Life eternal, life abundant, life as we have always dreamed it would be. Life beyond its wildest dream that would never run out. Talk about Revelation 21 verse 6 is saying a similar thing. It is done, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty I will give water without cost from the spring of the water of life. What's being said here is, is in me, in, in Christ, there is this eternal life-giving water, and it is me. And you can come and drink from this river. You can come and drink from this spring. This will be life forevermore. Then we see in the Old Testament, we see these, these verses. As the deer pants for streams of water, so my soul pants for you, my God. My soul thirsts for you, for the living God. We see that the psalmist, David, is, is saying, you know, just as a, as a deer pants for the water in the middle of a drought, as the, as the deer, is, is the tongue is hanging out, lolling for water, searching for water. That's how my soul feels right now. God, I need you. I'm thirsty for you, the living God. You ever felt like that? I know I have. Jeremiah is an interesting reading. It talks about this, my people have committed two sins. They have forsaken me the spring of living water, and have dug their own cisterns, broken cisterns that cannot hold water. So God, through the prophet Jeremiah, is saying to the Israelites, you've, you've committed two sins. You've rejected me. You've walked away from me. You've forsaken me. But not only that, you've gone to worship other idols. And that image there is you've dug your own cisterns, you've dug your own wells, and they're leaking. And the more you drink from these wells, the more that you try to get your sustenance from these wells, the more spiritually dry you become, the more, the more further away from me that, 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 that you have gone. And isn't this the disease of life today? We've rejected God and we're digging cisterns of our own. We're trying to find what we once had in God, what we were created to be, to be in this beautiful relationship, this unbroken relationship from God where we're receiving all our value, all our acceptance, all our belonging in him. But, but when the sin came, when the fall came, that was breached, that was broken, and now we're looking in all these other dirty, broken, leaking Systems and, and, and we think that by drinking of these waters we're going to be satisfied but we're getting more and more thirsty. We're digging harder and harder and, and less and less are we satisfied because we're not made for this system. We're not made for this dirty water. We're not made for all these addictions. We're not made for all these relationships that are toxic. We're not made for, for all this material stuff that we chase after and think that we can be happy by them. We're not made for that. 
And still we think we can find, if I could just have one more good house, if I, could, if I could just have more money, if I could just find another man or another woman, or I'll, I'll be happy for life. We find ourselves diseased and dysfunctional and, and, and truncated in our lives. broken, yearning for God but not realising that that's who we need. We're, we're, we're panting after him. We're, we're yearning for that something more than only God can give. But we're digging our own cisterns. Jesus had this life changing conversation with this Samaritan woman and it's related to exactly this verse let's look at this conversation and by the way the conversation between Nicodemus and this Samaritan woman has some similarities doesn't it but it also has some distinct contrasts as well. But both of them were thirsty. Both of them were yearning for life. We see last week that Nicodemus was, was digging from this, this broken, this leaking cistern called legalism. And he was coming up empty and Jesus said to him in this conversation, no, you don't need more of that. You need to be born again. You need me. Now we have this woman who's got equally a different yearning, but it's in a different area. Let's have a look at this conversation. Now he had to go through Samaria, so he came to a town in Samaria called Sychar. Now the plot of ground Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired as he was from the journey, sat down by the well. It was about the sixth hour. So we read earlier that Jesus is leaving the south. He's leaving Jerusalem. He's heading up to Galilee, to his home region. And there's Samaria in the middle. Now, Jews... And Samaritans at this point hated each other. And that's, uh, you know, that's, that's really, I'm forgetting words today, I don't know, I'm just getting all tongue-tied. That's to say the least. They really, really hated each other with a passion. And a lot of Jews, instead of going up through Samaria, if they were travelling to Galilee, would often go to the east of the Jordan and travel around the other side, back into Galilee, so that they could avoid Samaria, so that they could avoid speaking and even looking at Samaritans. But not Jesus. He goes straight up through the middle. And he comes to this place near a village called Sychar in Samaria, and he comes to Jacob's well. Now, this place is steeped in history, uh, Jewish history. It's here that Jacob bought a plot of land. One of the patriarchs back in Genesis bought a plot of land and, and on his deathbed, he bequeathed it to his son, Joseph, his youngest son, who had rose up to become this huge prominent figure in Egypt. And when Joseph died, he was buried there. So to the, to the Samaritans, to the people of this area, this is sacred ground. There's a lot of Jewish history here. And Jacob's well was here, as I said, and, and Jacob dug this well himself, and it was about 100 feet deep. And it wasn't a well that was full of wonderful water. It sort of seeped through the soil. And uh, it wasn't that beautiful, uh, running, thriving, living water that we've just been talking about. Jesus was tired from the journey. He sat down by this well. It was about noon, the sixth hour. Hottest part of the day. And what happens? A Samaritan woman 
came to draw water. Jesus said to her, will you give me a drink? Who was this woman? There's a lot of question marks around this woman who came to Jesus at this well. As I said, it's noon. It's midday. She's alone. Most of the women of the village would often uh, go together to the wells. It would be a social thing. There would be all the town gossip happening in the mornings when they grab it in the cool of the day. That was, that was Jewish life. That was Arab life. But this woman is bypassing better wells in, t wells in town and walking outside the village on her own, risking her life because it's not safe for a woman to go on her own, and coming to this well by this fork in the road. There's something going on here, isn't there? If you add all these things up, we see a woman who's, well, an outcast. Someone who's been shunned by the other women. Someone who's been shamed. Shame is a big thing in cultures in the Middle East. Here's a woman who knows what it's like to suffer rejection. And this is the woman Jesus chose to speak to. What was her response to this simple question? Samaritan woman said to him, you are a Jew and I am a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? For Jews do not associate with Samaritans. We see kind of a prickly response from this woman. And this really is a, is a conversation that uh, in conventional terms, back in Israel, back in Samaria, these conversations never happened. You see, for Jesus to talk to this, this Samaritan woman at the well, he had to cross racial barriers. As I said, Jews and Samaritans hated each other. And there's centuries of, of, of this hostility, going back to uh, when the Assyrian Empire conquered the northern kingdom of Israel. When that happened, uh, as, as conquerors often do, they uprooted a whole lot of Israelites, a whole lot of Jews, and moved them to different parts of the Assyrian Empire. And what they did then was they brought foreigners into the land and what happened was you know the Jews who were still in the land would marry foreigners they would have children children of mixed race and so on and so on and before too long the, the Jews from the southern kingdom were saying these guys are no longer Jews these guys are part of a, of, of a mixed race they're not one of us they've deserted the flock and this, this hostility grew even more when uh, the same thing happened to the southern kingdom around Jerusalem. The Babylonian Empire at the day sacked Jerusalem, took off exiles into Babylon, brought people in. But the Jews there kept their racial purity. And when it came to building the temple in Jerusalem again, because it had been sacked, it had been destroyed the Samaritans offered their help and the Jews refused. You're not one of us anymore. Go away. And so from that point on, there's been hostility. Even between the Testaments, even between the Old and the New Testament, a guy by the name of John Hyrcanus, a, a, a Jew in the Maccabean revolt, went and sacked their temple and destroyed their temple on Mount Gerizim. So we've got two 
the Jews and Samaritans, the Jews worship in Jerusalem. The Samaritans set up their own alternate worship on Mount Gerizim. The Samaritans changed their scriptures. They, they, they just believed in the first five books of the Bible. And they changed their worship. They, they said that Mount Gerizim was where Abraham took Isaac up and was to make a sacrifice of him. This is where, rather than Jerusalem, this is where Abraham met Melchizedek. So there was a tampering with the scriptures, a truncated belief, different to down south. They hated each other. For Jesus to cross that racial barrier is something I don't think we quite understand here today. But then he crossed the gender barrier as well. Like the Jews, Jewish males did not talk publicly with females. Jewish rabbis, Jesus was a rabbi. Uh, rabbis never spoke to women. They didn't even speak to their families in public. And we had teachers over there, Pharisees, who were called the bruised and bleeding ones. Do you know why they were called the bruised and bleeding ones? Because whenever they saw a woman in the street, they'd close their eyes. And they'd trip over things and they'd run into walls. Could you imagine what that would be like? Of course, cuts, wounds, bleeding. Imagine a Pharisee walking down the Logan Hyperdome. <laughs> Pretty interesting, hey? Jesus also crossed a social barrier. This was, woman was a social outcast. This woman... Had, uh, was a woman of, uh, I guess, low morals. She made some mistakes. She was regretting them, but the mistakes were there. She, she, was, she was put out by her own community. This conversation with this woman that Jesus had is shocking to a Jew. Here's this, this so-called righteous a uh, rabbi teacher who's having a conversation with a woman who has loose morals and she's a Samaritan woman to boot. This is shocking for the Jews. Conversation continues. Jesus answered, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that asks you for a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. Sir, the woman said, you have nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. Where can we get this living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob, who gave us the well and drank from it himself? As did all his sons and his flocks and herds. Jesus, it's a bit like Nicodemus, isn't it? Nicodemus, you must be born again. How can I be born again? I'm born into a mother's womb. He was thinking physically. Well, this woman is doing exactly the same thing. She's thinking about physical water. She talked that, that, that word that said living water, those couple of words that said living water, and she took it as running water, fresh water, good water. And she's saying, how can you do this? You can't even draw any water from this well. Where are you going to get this living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob? He's the one who built this well. He fed his flocks and his herd and his family with this. Are you greater than him? This was kind of like blasphemy to this Samaritan woman. Still prickly. How could you, how could you say that? You're not greater than Jacob. Our father, our hero. So she's thinking on this physical plane. Jesus is talking on this spiritual plane and she's really prickly. Jesus answered, everyone who drinks this water will, never, uh, will, will be thirsty again. He's pointing to that well. He's pointing to how deep that is. You drink this water, you'll be thirsty again. But whoever drinks the water I give him will never thirst. 
Indeed, the water I give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. I think it's at this point her eyes are open. I think at this point she's wanting to know more. She says these words, Sir, give me this water so that I won't get thirsty and have to keep coming here to draw water. She's slowly getting there. Jesus says something shocking. Go call your husband and come back. I have no husband, she replied. Jesus said to you, you are right when you say you have no husband. The fact is you've had five husbands. And the one you now have is not your husband. What you have said is quite true. What is Jesus doing here? Why is Jesus bringing this up? I think she's almost getting ready to pull the shutters down again. This is confronting her. This is pulling her towards the reality of her life, the the stuff she's had to face. And as a result of these sins, she's been rejected. She's a moral outcast. Why did he have to bring this up? Jesus is highlighting uh, that, that, that she's been digging. She's been digging from broken cisterns. If only I could find the right man. If only I could find this this perfect man. I'm just going to keep digging. I'm going to keep digging. And the further and further and the deeper she's gone, she's become less satisfied and less satisfied and less satisfied. She's drinking from a well that never satisfies. It only brings addiction. It only brings uh, more and more of the same. Jesus is saying, and not in a condemning way, by the way, he's saying that's the life you live. It's fruitless, it's pointless, it's getting you nowhere. I have what you need. I have this living water that will satisfy you forever, never to be thirsty again. In the video on the chosen Jesus starts to name all the husbands. He starts to say, your first husband was Ezra. You wanted to honour God with that marriage. You wanted this to be special. You wanted to be this to be a, a just the way your life would be to, to serve God by serving your husband and how things went wrong. How things went belly up. Your second husband was, uh, let's call him Ravi. You really loved him. On your wedding night, he smelled like oranges. You loved him. It was a good marriage, but you still walked away. And every time you go past the oranges at the markets, you think of him when you smell what oranges. And there's deep regret, deep remorse. Jesus really bringing a mirror to this lady and saying, look in deeply. Has any of this stuff brought you any deep satisfaction has any of this stuff ever brought you the life that you're looking for I have that water that can satisfy this woman changes tack straight away whether it's an an evasive plan or whether it's part of the conversation I'm not sure but What does she say? Sir, the woman said, I can see that you're a prophet. 
Our fathers worshipped on this mountain, that's Mount Gerizim. But you Jews claim that the place where we must worship is in Jerusalem. She's asking something really important here, I think. She's just had her, Jesus face her sins. Jesus shone a mirror on her life. She's convicted. And the question inside her, I think, is she's asking, where do I take a sacrifice to him? How do I get right with God? Where do I make amends? Where do, where, where's the atonement I can make for my sin? Is it Jerusalem? Or is it up on this mountain, Gerizim? The big question with her is, where can I find God? Where can I find God in the midst of this mess that is my life? I think he's forgotten me. I think he's, he's walked away years ago. He's abandoned me. Where can I find him? He doesn't remember me. Yeah, I so desperately need him. I can see that now. Jesus said these beautiful words. Believe me, woman, a time is coming when you'll worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You Samaritans worship what you do not know. Remember, they changed the scriptures. They, they've only got a truncated view of God. For salvation is from the Jews. Yet a time is coming and has now come. The time's here. When true worshippers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. They're the kind of worshippers the Father is looking for. What? I don't have to go to this mountain. I don't have to go to that mountain. It's, it's about spirit and truth. That's where I can find God. Yes. Head. Truth, heart encounter. That's where you'll find God. You don't have to go to a cathedral. You don't have to go to a temple. You don't even have to go to a church to find God. You can meet him anywhere. And this woman met Jesus, the Christ, the Son of God, at a well. The woman said, I know that Messiah called Christ is coming. When he comes, he will explain everything to us. Then Jesus declared, I who speak to you am he. Jesus revealed who he was. And this is the first time he did it until he was arrested and tried. The first person he revealed himself as the Messiah proper to was this woman, a Samaritan woman, a woman who was an outcast. I am the Messiah. In me, you will find living waters. What did she do after that? She put down the water buckets, left them there. She ran into the town and she couldn't contain herself. You have to come and see this guy. He told me everything I ever knew. Could this guy be the Christ? And as we read in the reading that Jesus stayed another couple of days, he saw a, a harvest and many in the town believed in Jesus Christ as the Son of God, believed that he was the saviour of the world. Now, I don't know about you, but there may be some people in the room that really resonate 
with this Samaritan woman. You might be saying the same thing, I've experienced rejection. I'm an outcast in my own family, among my own people. I've got my addictions. I've made my poor choices. I've gone down a path that's led me to this, this cistern that I'm drinking of and it's, it's never making me happy. It's just taking me deeper and deeper and I can't seem to find my way out. Maybe that's you today. Maybe you're in a place in that cistern where you're going, I, I just want to know where to find God. I want to know that he hasn't forgotten me. I want to know that, that there is a way back. This story tells me something that's important for you if you're in that place. Jesus, the Son of God, left his eternal place entered into his creation walked our dusty roads showed us how to live showed us who God was and on that day at 12 o'clock midday where this woman comes Jesus was there the son of God was there he met with this woman he knew it was coming he saw it before time began He broke cultural barriers. He broke gender barriers. He pushed past the stigma of this woman who had loose morals to speak to her about living water, to change her life from that day on. And then in Jerusalem, some time later, he died on her behalf for her sins. God knows you and he loves you and he's offering you living water right now, right here. The call is to stop. Stop digging from those dirty, stinking wells that bring no life. They're stagnant. They bring death. Jesus is saying, come to me. Come to me. Come to me. The living water. Come to me and there you'll find life in all its abundance. Here and now. And it wells up into eternal life. Come to me. Jesus said these words a couple of chapters later. In chapter 7, verse 37, this is the last day of one of the festivals. Jerusalem is crowded. And he stood and said in a loud voice. Okay, he's not saying this softly. He said this in a loud voice. Let anyone who is thirsty come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as scripture has said, rivers of living water will flow from within them. By this he meant the Spirit, whom those who believed in him were later to receive. Up to that time, the Spirit had not been given since Jesus had not yet been glorified. Jesus declared, I am the living waters. Come to me. Come to me and you'll have life in its abundance. Let us pray.
Thank you, Lord, that you love us. Thank you, Lord, that that call is still there. Thank you, Lord, that you haven't deserted us. Thank you, Lord, that even though we've taken some terrible, terrible paths, we've, we've ended up in places that just is, is just rotten and dysfunctional. Thank you, Lord, that you sent your son to rescue us from these places. If there's someone here today who's reaching out to Jesus Christ, the living water, I'd encourage you to pray this. Lord, I'm a sinner. Lord, I've made a mess of my life. I've been digging in those cisterns that leak. Lord, I've been trying to search for you. I recognise that now. But I've been trying to look for you in different places, wrong places. Lord, I turn to you now, the living water. I put my trust in you. I thank you for your death on the cross for me. I thank you that you love me. I thank you died so that I might be forgiven completely. I put my trust in you. I stand in that place of faith, not just today, but for the rest of my life. Please fill me with your spirit. Fill me with these living waters. Lord, that I might know life in its abundance today and for all eternity.